Okay, I'm starting now. Okay, so, um, so that was a sort of uh, graph-based semi-supervised learning um, basics. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about computation. Um, so the basic computation involves solving a sparse linear system of equations. Uh, I'm saying sparse because I, it, it's not necessary that the matrix W be sparse, but for large problems, um, it's very, very sensible to sparsify that matrix W somehow by just removing all the weak edges. So here's just the equation for solving that sparse linear system of equations. You definitely do not want to do this, type this into MATLAB, because in general, you don't want to solve the system of equations by inverting a matrix first and then multiplying it by things. Uh, now, the good news is solving sparse linear systems of equations is incredibly well-studied topic. And there are several ways of doing this, uh, for example, uh, doing conjugate gradients on this function f uh, seems to be a good iterative method for, for getting uh, solutions of the system. Clearly, for very large systems, we don't need to solve it exactly. We just run a few steps of conjugate gradients until our uh, vector f of probabilities is converting to something sensible. Um, a different way of doing this is via belief propagation. We take that Markov random field, and we interpret it as an undirected uh, factor graph. And we simply run messages in the Gaussian case. That just corresponds to a different way of solving a linear system of equations. I'm not convinced it's better, but it's certainly an interesting alternative for certain graphs. Um, and now, a very interesting idea by Zhu and Lafferty was uh, if your problem is very, very large, take your very large graph and try to simplify it somehow. So create a smaller backbone um, graph and then uh, by clustering, for example, data points locally and then solve the problem on the smaller backbone graph. So this is a way of dealing with very large data sets through uh, clever use of clustering. Okay, so uh, there have been a number of other approaches to semi-supervised learning. This is actually a very big field. And what I talked about mostly was stuff from 2003. A lot has happened even before and after this. So just to mention a few examples, the EM algorithm for semi-supervised learning um, is a more generative approach to solving this problem that worked well in some cases, but, but not generally that well, to be honest. Uh, especially because the EM algorithm has a tendency to run away into solutions that were good clusterings but not good classifications of the data. Uh, Zimmer and Yakola had a semi-supervised learning method using Markov random walks on graphs, which was very elegant but um, somewhat more complicated than what I've described. Belkin and Niyogi have uh, a method that regularizes a function by using the top few eigenvectors of the Laplacian which gives you somewhat different answers, but is very similar in spirit. Uh, Neil Lawrence and Mike Jordan um, have an approach to semi-supervised learning based on Gaussian processes, which is very similar to something I'm about to describe, which is a transductive SVM. And um, it has a basically a Gaussian process model with three classes, zero, one, and in between, let's say. And basically what they're trying to do is to avoid um, labeling points in between. And what that does is it separates out uh, the, the classes from each other in an interesting way. Um, Zhu et al, different Zhu et al, um, use uh, a loss function with the normalized graph Laplacian as a regularizer rather, rather than the graph Laplacian. And that um, seems to have some uh, nice behavior that uh, gets rid of some of the normalization that we have to do afterwards. And the transductive SVM, or sometimes called semi-supervised SVM, uh, is an interesting idea for doing uh, semi-supervised learning, where essentially, instead of finding a maximum margin, here's this caricature of that, 
instead of finding a maximum margin separating hyperplane, these are the plus label points and minus label points and unlabeled points in black. The dotted lines are the maximum margin separation. And what this does is it tries to optimize both over the margin and the labels of the unlabeled points. Okay? So in this case, this would be the transductive SVM solution. Uh, it's the best margin you can get if you also label all your, your unlabeled points. Of course, labeling the unlabeled points is a combinatorially hard problem, so you have to relax this somehow to solve the uh, transductive SVM. Okay, so um, what I want to spend the, the last few minutes, um, and it's very few minutes now, but I think I can give you the idea, is on active learning in a semi-supervised context. So in semi-supervised learning, we are trying to use the unlabeled data for classification. And part of the motivation was this concept that maybe labeling is expensive. But now imagine a procedure that is allowed to interact with the labeler. So it has a big pool of unlabeled data. And instead of passively receiving labels, it can tell the labeler, now please label me this data point. Okay? This is the basic concept between, behind active learning. The learner interacts with the labeler and asks for labels of particular points one at a time. And that's sometimes called queries. It selects queries in the unlabeled uh, data to ask for labels. And when we put these two ideas together, it's incredibly powerful. So now we have a situation where yeah, you, you start maybe with a very tiny amount of labeled data. And the learner uh, gets labels from the labeler in what the learner thinks is the most efficient way so as to learn how to classify all the data. So we want um, criteria for active learning that will allow us to select points intelligently. And one heuristic that is quite widely used is this idea of selecting points that are most uncertain. But it turns out selecting the most uncertain point is not a good heuristic for active learning. Let me describe that. So consider the following situation. Uh, it's a semi-supervised learning situation where I have one label point here, labeled 1, and the other label point here, labeled 0. And I have all of these yellow, unlabeled points. If I were to, um, so the, the key idea is that the point A is equidistant from these two, so it's the most uncertain point. Whereas here we have a cluster of points. Now, um, selecting the point to be labeled that's most uncertain would go and select this point A. And that seems silly. Because if I uh, select this point A, all I'm going to do is learn the label of A. Whereas if I select uh, almost any of these points, like for example, the middle point in this cluster B, not only do I get to know the label for B, but I'm going to have a good guess for all of the other labels in that cluster. So rather than uh, selection or active learning by uh, finding points with maximum ambiguity, what we're going to look at is minimizing the ex estimated generalization error on the unlabeled data. OK? So what do I mean by that? Well, the error on the unlabeled data is simply the sum over the unlabeled data. This, uh, uh, the sum over the possible uh, labels that that uh, that point could have. And this is an indicator for making an error. An error happens if the sign of my function is different from the true label. And I'm doing an average with respect to the true distribution here. OK? So this is my um, uh, generalization error. All right? Now, I want to minimize my expected generalization error. Uh, what I don't know is what the true label is. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to simply take my current best estimate for the probabilities of the labels. And that's given by f. And I'm going to plug that into this equation above. 
So I plug in fi as the, prob the true probability that yi equals 1. So that is uh, my estimated generalization error. When I plug that into this equation and I simplify a little bit, what I find is that my estimated generalization error is the sum over the unlabeled data of the minimum of fi times 1 minus fi. Uh, sorry, minimum of fi comma 1 minus fi. Okay. That's my estimated generalization error. And now what I need to do for active learning is to figure out what's going to happen to my estimated generalization error if I obtain um, the label on the cave point. How valuable is that cave point to me? So this is the estimated generalization error after querying the cave point and observing label yk. That's given by this. And what I have to do there is recompute the function values at all of the unlabeled points after querying that point. This involves essentially retraining the, um, the model under the assumption that I observe the label on the cave point. But the good thing is that the training of this model involves solving a linear system of equations. So all we're asking for is what would be the solution to this linear system of equations if we now had a one more observation. And we can solve for that in an incremental way. So this is a, a, like a rank one update to my linear system of equations. And it's given by this. So this is the, given my current solution to the f value on the unlabeled points, this is my new solution after observing a new label. And so finally, my criterion is to select the data point k, which minimizes my expected generalization error, uh, averaging over both possibilities of observing a 0 or a 1 for the label for k. Okay. So this is now something that I can compute. Yes? Um, so uh, this only takes into account all my uh, knowledge about the labels is given by my current function f. My current function f is supposed to, uh, on the unlabeled points, is supposed to uh, capture all information that I have. So it doesn't take into account the relative frequencies of the classes, for example, if that's what you mean. Yeah. Yes? It, um, it takes into account the noise in the query point in the sense that it assumes that if I query at xk, the probability of observing a 1 is fk, and the probability of observing a 0 is 1 minus fk. That is its best guess for what the noise model is on the label points. Okay, So we can compute this efficiently um, for a pool of points. And then we select a point that minimizes the expected generalization error. And here's the sort of results that we get, which is interesting. Here is classifying ones versus zeros. Uh, on this axis, we have the size of the labeled set. And here is the accuracy. So here's what you get. If you pick five points using this active learning method, you get something like 98% accuracy on this problem. That's choosing five good points. Right? If you choose the most uncertain query, then it takes you maybe 12 points to reach that same level. If you pick points randomly but still use a semi-supervised method, then you get there around here. Um, and if you just ignore the unlabeled data and you just train on labeled data, um, with an SVM, for example, then you get this here. Okay, so the the story here should be interpreted as unlabeled data helps in a semi-supervised learning context, and active learning with a good criterion definitely also helps. Here's another example. This is the same PC versus Mac example. Here again, if you choose something like five or six documents, you're getting above ninety percent accuracy with the active learning setting. 
and all the other methods take much longer to get to anything even close to that. Okay? Yes? I was wondering which uh, implementation of which version of S can you use for um, So it's, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't really matter in the sense that the story isn't anything about SVMs in this case um, being good or bad. The point is that SVM was chosen here as a state-of-the-art discriminative classifier that is just using the label data. So this is not a transductive SVM. This is just a, a state-of-the-art classifier on the label data um, using you know, the reasonable heuristics for choosing the kernel, et cetera, in SVM. OK. So um, just a couple of words. A active learning is a great area. It's very interesting and very useful, potentially. Just a couple of words on Bayesian semi-supervised learning, and then I'll wrap up. So everything I talked about was not really applications of the sum rule and product rule, like I talked about before. It was much more like, I have a heuristic. Let's come up with a graph-based <coughs> method. We can interpret it this way. We can run the algorithm in this way, et cetera. So um, how would you approach this problem from a, a probabilistic modeling or Bayesian point of view? Um, well, we kind of would be interested, certainly I would be interested in a single unified framework for inductive semi-supervised learning from a Bayesian point of view. Um, I don't think we really have such a thing, or maybe the answer is so trivial it's not really uh, interesting. Um, so let's think about that a little bit. And it's useful to think about that in the context of uh, making a distinction between discriminative and generative models. So in a discriminative model, we, have, um, uh, we can write it out in this way. We have our inputs x and our labels y. And the model says there's some distribution over the inputs. We're usually not going to care about that. And then we directly parameterize some distribution over the labels given the inputs through some parameters phi. Now, semi-supervised learning, if I write down this graph here, semi-supervised learning is not possible. Okay? The reason it's not possible is because uh, all information about the distribution of x is conditionally independent from my classifier. So even if you were told exactly the distribution of x, that would not change at all uh, the distribution, the, um, the phi that characterizes the parameters of the classifier. So in order to do semi-supervised learning, you need to somehow tie together the parameters of your density over x and the parameters of your classifier. So there needs to be a link between theta and phi in this model. Okay. Only then is it possible conceptually. Now, on, on the other hand, if you do generative modeling and you say, first you model the label distribution and then you model the class conditional densities or distributions of the x's given the labels, then clearly the unlabeled data gives you lots of information about the potential labels. In this case, semi-supervised learning is simply a missing data problem. For some of your data points, you observe the labels. In other data points, you don't observe the labels, but you infer the labels for the unlabeled data using whatever inference algorithm you want. Okay. Okay. Um, but unfortunately, the generative approach is a bit of a nuisance in this context because, for example, for the free food cam application, I could do it easily, or they could do it easily, just by forming a graph on the images. But modeling these images is a pain, right? You really don't feel like you need to go that far to actually solve this problem. There are certainly examples. But the bottom line is, in general, semi-supervised learning is just going to be another missing data problem. Your labels are somehow missing, and you need to impute them. OK, so I'll wrap up there. Uh, I talked about semi-supervised learning with harmonic functions. Um, when you couple semi-supervised learning with active learning, you get really interesting advantages because your learner can now query the data set in an intelligent way. And there has been a huge amount of research in this area, but there's still a lot of open questions. 
And this is just some of the references for, uh, for this particular uh, talk. Great. Thanks.